At that time, the disciples approached Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child over, placed it in their midst, and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. My grandfather's parents took him as a baby to be baptized and they told the pastor that they'd chosen the name Thaddeus for their child. The Irish pastor, an old druid who ruled the roost in his parish, declared that he didn't care for that name and he proceeded to baptize my grandfather as Theodore. This initiated a dynasty of Theodores in the O'Malley clan. My grandfather, my father, my brother, my nephew, my great nephew, all because of a despotic pastor. Actually, I've come to love the name, which means a gift from God, because all of these Theodores have been God's gift to me and to my family. The passing on of a name from one generation to another in a family is often very significant. Today I want to reflect on three great women who shared the same name and a spiritual connection in the body of Christ. I'm referring to the three Teresas, the big flower, the little flower, and the flower of Calcutta. The first two Teresas have a connection to my titular church, Santa Maria de la Vittoria, that Pope Benedict assigned to me when he named me a cardinal. It's a lovely small church in Rome that's very famous because of a statue by Bernini that graces the church and because it appears in one of Dan Brown's novels in which my church is the venue for the murder of a cardinal who is burnt alive. The Bernini statue of the ecstasy of St. Teresa of Avila is considered one of the most beautiful statues in Rome. When I was installed as cardinal of Santa Maria de la Vittoria, I announced in my homily that it was my intention to bring this valuable statue of St. Teresa of Avila back to Boston with me. The Carmelite friars who provide the pastoral service in my Roman church later responded by telling me Napoleon tried. In 1887, Louis Martin took his daughter Celine and Therese on a diocesan pilgrimage to Rome to mark the golden jubilee of the priestly ordination of Pope Leo XIII. In many ways, it was like a grand tour for the girls. About a fourth of the pilgrims were from the nobility and others from very prosperous bourgeois families. The pilgrimage lasted over a month. They traveled by train and stayed in the finest hotels. They visited Milan, Venice, Padua, Bologna, Assisi, Naples, Florence, Pisa, Genoa. But the highlight of the trip was Rome and the audience with the Holy Father. This is where we see that despite all of the glorious splendor of the trip, Therese was focused on her vocation, on her desire to give herself entirely to the Lord as a Carmelite nun. For that reason, the young Therese visited my church during her pilgrimage, certainly because of the fam famous Bernini statue of her patroness, St. Teresa of Avila, and also because of the presence of the Carmelite friars. Her feast day has become the most important annual celebration in my titular church. St. Therese and her family also visited the Colosseum, where the young Therese climbed over a fence so that she could draw near and kiss the stones where the martyrs shed their blood. On that same trip, accompanying the distinguished pilgrims and the diocesan bishop, the young Therese participated in a special papal audience. Following the customs of the time, each pilgrim drew near to kiss the Holy Father's hand and remained kneeling to receive the Pope's blessing. No one was supposed to address the Holy Father, but young Therese grasped the Holy Father's hand and said, Holy Father, in honor of your jubilee, I want you to let me enter the Carmel at 15 years of age. The Swiss guard actually had to lift her up and carry her away. It was quite a spectacle. As a matter of fact, in 1935, Therese's sister, 
Pauline received a letter from an Italian nun stationed in Egypt that contained a delightful surprise. The nun explained that many years earlier, her father came home from his duties in the papal household where he was a Swiss guard and told the family at dinner about a beautiful French girl who had implored the Holy Father to allow her to enter a Carmel in France even though she was underage. He had tears in his eyes as he told the story and the family was deeply moved as they listened. When the nun read the account in the autobiography, the book fell from her hands. She realized that that girl her father had seen was Saint Therese. Therese lived in the world of Marx, Freud, Darwin, and Nietzsche. And although she had little formal education, her insights and intuition have left a legacy of wisdom and spiritual genius that has allowed so many to find meaning in life and a path to holiness. When Therese's patron saint, Saint Teresa of Avila, was a young girl, she wanted to run off to America with her brother in the hopes that they would be martyred by the Aboriginal pe people living there. Indeed, Saint Teresa's brother did go off to the New World to serve the king, but Saint Teresa did not cross the ocean to be martyred. Her mission was to reform religious life and indeed the church in her beloved country. Saint Therese also has this great devotion to the martyrs and certainly had been exposed to the high road to holiness, strict asceticism, strong discipline and demanding sacrifices. One needed a powerful will to storm the heights of such holiness, to be a great soul. Unfortunately, many people, instead of being inspired by the challenge, find themselves overwhelmed, incapable of attempting to measure up to these heroic standards. Saint Therese, the little flower in the walls of her Carmel, quietly overthrew that spirituality. She realized that she was a little soul, and she also knew that this is what is revolutionary about her that she and all the other little souls like her could still become great saints. Ahead of her time, Therese believed in that fundamental message of the Second Vatican Council, the universal call to holiness. Little souls who make up the vast majority of humanity are well aware of our limitations, our frustrations, even with the small difficulties encountered each day with our spiritual poverty and inability to, to come close to accomplishing any of the thing of great significance. Nevertheless, we can still have an intimate relationship with God and our lives can have meaning and the legacy equal to that of the great soul. The way for most people, as it was for Saint Therese, is not the way of greatness, but the way of littleness. Therese came to realize that the dramatic and severe penances that required a truly heroic spirit were not her path to holiness. Her path was to become like a little child, trusting in God, accepting life's crosses, doing the little things of everyday life, but doing them with great love. For Therese, the little penances of accepting people's human foibles and being kind to them was more important than some huge sacrifice which might only serve to fuel our vanity and our pride. She's a realist of the present moment. She writes of herself, it seems to me that love penetrates and surrounds me. Each instance in this merciful love renews me, purifies my soul and allows no trace of sin to remain. She writes elsewhere, if I committed all possible crimes, I would always have the same confidence. They would be like a drop of water thrown in a blazing fire. What a beautiful message for us. Despite our sins and limitations, God's love and mercy engulfs us. Our Heavenly Father is anxious to heal the wounds of our sins and receive us joyfully into His arms like the father of the prodigal son who is so overwhelmed with joy that his less than perfect child returns home. Few saints have touched 
the Catholic imagination in the way that St. Therese has done. It's amazing that in a world that exalts activism, this young contemplative nun has touched the hearts of so many. Without ever leaving her cloister, she became the patroness of the missions, along with St. Francis Xavier, who baptized more people than anyone since the days of St. Paul. Therese, on the other hand, became a missionary through her life of prayer. She understood that her vocation was to spend her life helping to save souls by praying for them. She recounts the wonderful story of how, as a young girl, she heard about a man called Franzini who had murdered two women and a girl and was completely unrepentant for his crimes. Therese prayed fervently for his conversion. And seconds before his execution, the murderer grabbed the crucifix from the hands of the chaplain and kissed the wounds of Christ. When Therese read the account in the newspapers, she was filled with such joy, knowing that her prayer contributed to this dramatic conversion. We too are called to be missionaries, to spread the faith by our good example, by our works of mercy, and by our prayers. I once heard of a Chinese family that actually converted to Catholicism after watching some Western visitors to their village who made the sign of the cross and prayed before they ate dinner in a restaurant. The Chinese, who had never met any Christians before, went over and asked them what the ritual was. The people took the opportunity to witness to their Christian and Catholic faith. The Chinese listened with great attention and eventually asked how they might join the church. In this case, grace before meals was a little, the little way that led pagans into Christ's church. God's grace gives us a very special opportunity to love the little way of St. Therese by practicing the works of mercy, by doing little things with great love, and at the same time praying fervently for all of those that God puts in our path. An important part of St. Therese's little way is to live the present moment. So often we're pulled down by the problems and the pains of the past. We live in the shadow of our sins and our failings. We must learn to trust in God's mercy and rejoice in his pardon. Likewise, we must live in a world that is focused in the future, but we must learn to live in the present. Therese knew that the past can never be retrieved, and it's a waste of time to grieve for it. If we believe, as she did, that God is nothing but mercy and love, we can put our sins behind us once we have sought forgiveness and forge past them. The deeds are part of history, but the guilt is gone even as the history is gone. As for the future, only God knows what it will hold, and we may safely leave it in His hands. The only thing that we can be sure of of the future is that the providence of God will always rise before the sun, as the great French preacher Henri Lacordaire used to say. When tomorrow becomes today, God will be there to sustain us. An American bishop I knew very well, Bishop Patrick Ahern, who died in 2011 at the age of 92, was one of the principal promoters of the church's decision to name St. Therese a doctor of the church. He's the person who helped me to understand the greatness of her theology and her insights into the gospel. One of his writings on St. Therese, Bishop Ahern speaks about a very dear friend of his, Father Jim Conlon, who as a child contracted infantile paralysis, polio, which left one leg a few inches shorter than the other. The heel of one shoe was built up to make up for the difference. It was a great source of suffering to this young man who would like to go and play basketball with his friends and go to dances and other events where he could only be a spectator. One day he encountered a priest at Fordham University, an old Jesuit. The priest grabbed him by the arm and said, what's that you have there, son? Polio? 
Jim said, yes, Father. Are you glad you have polio? The priest asked. Bitterly, Jim replied, no, I'm not glad that I have polio. But the priest replied, let me tell you something, son. Until the day comes when you can say to God and really mean it, Lord, I'm glad to have polio, you'll never amount to anything. Without a further word, the priest walked away, and Jim never saw him again in his life. At first, he burned with resentment. That night, he didn't sleep. He wept and he prayed. And suddenly, he felt that God was near. At length, he found himself saying, Lord, I'm glad I have polio. And he knew that he really meant it. Years later, he often recounted that story and assured people that he would never become a priest if that old Jesuit had not confronted him with that statement. I think the story is an example of the little way. What Jim did that night was to put into practice St. Therese's doctrine of littleness, of joy, of wholehearted acceptance of ourselves with all our diminishments, no matter what they be, being glad that we are who we are and have what we have. Therese never taught us to seek suffering. What she taught us to do was simply to love life the way that it is and ourselves the way that we are, to love what she called our littleness. By this she meant our poverty, our failures, the things we're ashamed of and wish that we could do over if we had another chance. She did not hesitate to call these our riches. When her loving father literally went out of his mind and had to be committed to an insane asylum, even though her father's illness broke her heart, she referred to the family sufferings as our riches. Therese teaches us to accept what we cannot change, to welcome it as God's holy will. As Bishop Ahern observed at the end of his life, when I look back upon so many disasters, I realize that they were blessings in disguise. Without them, I would not have grown, but I would have remained selfish in the vain person that I was. I dare to think that some of the best qualities in me would not be there if some of the worst things had not happened to me. Accepting all those setbacks with love puts us on the path of the little way of St. Therese. Like the other great doctors of the church, St. Therese had insights into the gospel that transformed her life, that she was able to articulate in order to help others find the path to sanctity. In living out her life of faith, Therese sensed that everything that she was able to accomplish came from the generous love of God in her life. She was convinced that at the end of her life, she would go to God with empty hands. Why? Because all was accomplished in union with God. Catholics and other Christians have been so attracted to St. Therese. Her little way seems to put holiness of life within the reach of ordinary people. Live out your days with confidence in God's love for you, Therese would tell us. Recognize that each day is a gift in which your life can make a difference by the way you choose to live it. Put hope in the future, which God will be all and love will consume your spirit. Choose life, not the darkness of pettiness or greed, St. Therese knew the difference love makes by allowing love to be the statement she made each day of her life. Along with St. Francis of Assisi and Padre Pio, St. Therese is one of the most popular saints in the Catholic Church. When her relics were taken on an international pilgrimage, millions and millions of people came to venerate those relics. I prayed before them in Philadelphia and also in Panama and Argentina. Like St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese was also named a doctor of the church by St. John Paul II in 1997. Just as St. Teresa of Avila inspired the young Therese on the path to holiness, so another young woman born in the Ottoman Empire 
was later to be, become Albania, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, found inspiration in St. Therese of Lisieux. She chose Teresa as a religious name, thus carrying on the glorious tradition of great saints who share the same name. Mother Teresa also embraced St. Therese's spirituality of the little way. Mother Teresa once said, I am a little pencil in the hand of God who is sending a love letter to the world. What a beautiful description of her ministry. That truly was a love letter to the world and at the same time, something beautiful for God, all in the little ways that lead straight to God's heart. Today, as we reflect on the short and hidden life of St. Therese of Lisieux and the other Theresas, we ask for the grace to embrace our own littleness and trustingly place our lives in God's hands. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the blessing of Almighty God, through the intercession of Our Lady and Saint Joseph, descend upon you, your loved ones, and your homes, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.